So <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, Michaela, Catherine, and Greg for the invitation again. Uh, this is my second year in a row, no, that's fine, doing this. Um, and so, so uh, I'm, I'm the, uh, so, so, I used so, to work. Rob, I want to correct you. I remember you being in person as well a couple of times here. So it's probably a fourth in a row. Yeah, but it's, I don't think it's for consecutive, like, you know, winning winning the NBA championship or something. Okay. Oh, anyway. sorry. <laughs> so, so I used to work at Civils, and then I moved to the UK, and I ran a Sax Beamline for a few years, and now I'm the, the uh, uh, science group leader for the Soft Condensed Matter Group, um, and we have in our group two Sax Beamlines, this high-throughput Sax Beamline, which is very similar to, to uh, Civils. But our our uh, our user community is is pretty vast, so we do a lot of uh, gels, anything that's a liquid, soaps, you know, chocolates, stuff like that. Um, and then we have another Saks Beamline, which is more of a multi-purpose workhorse where we could have you know a twelve meter uh, camera length and measure very large things. Um, and so the size ranges that we typically work with uh, for B twenty one, which is the kind of the bio Saks Beamline. It's a few hundred nanometers is the, is the largest dimension, and we can get down to uh, something about the size of like sucrose, uh, which you know you wouldn't really study. And then you know when we look at how the other beam lines like I twenty two, B twenty two, which is our infrared beam line, and the circular dichroism beam line, we cover a very large uh, uh, sense of, of of length scales. Um, but I'd like to just kind of draw your attention to the fact that. You know, this COVID vaccine, um, it came out with Pfizer and uh, uh, Moderna. This was all driven by uh, soft condensed matter and SACS research. There was no like high resolution structural information which, which generated this. Um, and, and it all came down to this paper, which was published in 2015. So, you know, the thing is, you don't need to make some structure to think you're going to save the world sometimes. Uh, SACS could get you there. Um, but the, the two techniques, I think, which are very complementary to SACS, and uh, Sybil's published this uh, last year, and they've done quite a, a few other papers with, with this group at, at uh, uh, the Advanced Light Sources, X-ray footprinting mass spectrometry. And, and I think as a technique, when you, when you do SACS and you think that you have something that's flexible or you want to do residue-specific uh, uh, testing of your hypothesis because you made an atomistic model, this is a really great technique that, that'll get you there. It'll, it could finish off that story. And, and I, would, I suggest you talk to Mikhail about that because he's, he's uh, or Greg, they've published papers with, with their colleagues in, in, uh, at the Advanced Light Source. And then the other technique is this technique called diffracted X-ray tracking. And what's, what's neat about this technique is you, you put on a little gold nanocrystal, you hit the, you hit the sample with, the, with a, essentially a pink, or white beam of, of really intense x-rays. And what you're looking at is, is the diffraction, single diffraction spot from that crystal wiggling around in solution for about 10 milliseconds or less, because the x-rays will destroy the sample. But what you get is how that thing wiggles in solution is based on the degrees of freedom of, of the macromolecule. And you can then uh, uh, use that to kind of understand if you have an intrinsic disordered protein, how is it moving in solution? Right, and this is a really great technique. You can see a little movie here of the spots moving around. Usually, collect you know something like tens to a hundred thousand uh, spots, and you make histograms and you can map out the distances. Um, so keep that in mind. Okay, so now onto the sacs. So when we talk about sacs, you you know we measure these intensities often on a relative scale. Some beam lines will put it on an absolute scale, which is scale to against water. Um, the this side of the Sachs curve towards zero is typically our lower or low resolution. And as you move up uh, to higher higher numbers here on Q, this is called our high resolution side or higher resolution side. So Q is a vector. It's called a momentum transfer vector. Um, it's independent of the distance to the detector and wavelength. It's normalized for that. The units are typically inverse angstroms if you collect in the US and the UK. Um, and then if you're in Europe and you collected it like Petro or the ESRF, your units are going to be inverse nanometers. And this is important because in scatter, we typically do things from angstroms and you have to convert to both. Um, you should recognize that the units are in inverse angstroms. 
So we call this reciprocal space and we measure SACs in reciprocal space. Um, the features of this curve uh, directly relate to shape. Um, at low resolution, we typically low meaning this part here. You can approximate the particle as a homogeneous body. And this is the basis for things like Damon and Gasbor. Um, the larger the object is, the faster the decay will happen. Okay. So uh, in, a, in, a, in a typical camera, a Sachs camera, you'll have your sample, which will be something like five to 20 microliters. Um, and then you'll have a camera that could be 1.5 to four meters away. Uh, you have this uh, uh, direct beam hitting this spot here, which is what we call the beam stop. And then you get these intensities that decay away. This is isotropic scattering, meaning that if you pick a point from the center and you go around in a circle, it should be the same intensity all the way around. Um, and if it's not, you have anisotropic scattering. And that usually means that you have some kind of ordering in the sample. Uh, but for the SACs that we do, the bio SACs that we do, uh, we measure SACs under dilute conditions. So that means what we're only seeing is the image of one particle at a time uh, summed up over all the particles. Uh, there's no correlations between them. Uh, the other thing in SACs, nothing goes missing, right? So if you have uh, tails that are moving, uh, you're, we're going to see that. If you have a, a system that's uh, in a monomer dimer equilibrium and it's weak, we'll see the monomer and the dimer at the same time. So everything scatters in SACs. Um, and then if you take your data that you measure in reciprocal space and you do the inverse Fourier transform, you get what we call the, the real space uh, form of the data or the P of R distribution. And this is the set of all pairwise distances, electron pairwise distances uh, within the particle. And you know, if you think about it, as you change your shape, uh, those distances will change, which will change the P of R distribution, which will then change the, the uh, uh, SACS intensities that you measure. Um, our signal is typically from about a thousand billion molecules when we measure, and conformational changes, remember this, are, are thermodynamic changes in state, and we will observe this by sex. Okay, so this is really, really important, especially if you're doing batch. Um, the stacks intensity curve that we measure is a difference measurement. So what you have is your sample with little particles in it, and then you have your buffer with no particles in it. And when you subtract the two, all these little blue dots should subtract away. And what you're left with is the scattering of the, these beam looking things and the ghost imprint of it in the buffer. Now, if your buffer isn't perfectly matched, then the, all the blue things don't go away. So it's really important that you treat your buffer just as precious as you treat your sample. So if you're doing a batch mode experiment and you have DTT in your buffer and you put your sample on ice, you should put your buffer on ice, right? So what you'll see is that you know, the rates of oxidation change will vary and then that'll affect ultimately the quality of your background subtraction. Okay, and essentially errors in buffer matching will limit the usefulness of the data. And this is typically, it limits the, the high Q or the higher resolution limits of the data. Okay, so as Greg was saying earlier, you have uh, batch mode experiments and then you have sex sex experiments. These are the, typically the two types of experiments you'll find at, at a, like a high throughput bio sex beam line. Um, you know, the batch mode experiment, um, it's, you know, five to 35 microliters per well, depending on where you're at. You could be, you know, a mixture, a single protein, whatever. You could be looking at condition screening. So maybe your protein's unstable. Uh, question is, how does pH affect it? How does salt affect it? Uh, different different uh, buffers, uh, presence of sucrose, glycerol. So batch mode is really good for just doing these basic types of screening experiments. And then you could use some of the nice web apps that they have available um, in Cali uh, at, at Sybils to, to look at large data sets. You could test ligand binding. You don't need a high quality sample here. You can just titrate in a ligand and ask this question, is it changing the conformational state of my protein? Um, likewise, <clears throat> if you have protein A and B, does it form a complex, right? Again, it's a very simple experiment you can do by match, uh, by batch mode, but really what's gonna be critical here is the quality of your buff buffer matching. Uh, sex sex experiments, you know, what's nice about them is that they, they take this mystery of the buffer matching out because, you know, hopefully, you know, everything goes well and you can just use the, the, the baseline in a sex, sex sex experiment as your buffer. 
your samples go up, you're looking at 30 to 50 microliters of sample. You're going to have about a three and a half fold dilution of the sample uh, at, at peak, especially if you just have one peak. It's different if it splits up into lots of peaks. Um, and you can get a great signal between 0.9 and 1 mg per mil typically uh, at the peak, right? Uh, which means that you need to inject around three to five microliters. Um, if you cannot concentrate your, pro your particle, maybe it's good to try repeated runs at, at lower concentrations and just average, like do it 10 times. As you can imagine, if you're doing it 10 times, it's 30 minutes per run. You know, you're looking at, you know, 300 minutes or around six to seven hours. Okay, so SACS is a structural tool. So SACS is a solution state measurement. Everything in the sample will contribute to scattering and sample quality determines the information that can be derived from the measurement. This is a structural assessment of the thermodynamic state. And it's just the fact that you measure at you know, 50 milliseconds to 300 seconds, and that's a long time for macromolecules. It's easy to calculate a SACS profile. You can use programs like Chrysol, Foxes, AquaSACS, WetSACS. And you know, what really varies between these programs is how they treat the water layer. And that's, that's crucial, especially if you're doing an IDP. And, and you know, my inclination is Chrysol is probably not the best calculator used for IDPs. Um, you can test the structural hypothesis. And this was the basic driving thing with SACS is I crystallize something, does it fit? Let me, let me just use the SACS calculator and test it. And I think what we see about 40% of the time, MX structures uh, can explain the SACS data, but this is not true for most of the time. And it's usually because you might have tails that are, that are, that are present, that are missing in the structure, loops that are moving around, a different oligomeric state, or, or the sample is simply just a mixture of states. As an experimental tool, you know, SACS is going to be sensitive to changes in the thermodynamic state. And this is what Greg was kind of getting at with, with screening, is that you can, you can use and, 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 and change temperatures, pHs to see how your particle is behaving. Um, you know, you can use this to assess flexibility. This, this gives us a sense that we have a flexible system, but what it doesn't really do is really, you know, pin that down when you use computational approaches to kind of guesstimate, or at least give a sense that you have a flexible system. Um, you can use this to improve samples for MX or EM. Uh, and, you know, SACS is really good at, at monitoring fiber formation and, or gel formation, right? So slow kinetics, you can take time shots you know, every five minutes and watch, watch the system evolve. So the SACS signal that we're measuring, if you go back to this uh, old picture of the MAR detector from Civils, is, you know, this point here is essentially right around here. And as we go around in circle, we get the average and we get that point. And as we keep moving down away from this, and we average around the circle here, you get another point, right? You get another point there. And you just keep going all the way, all the way up. So in order to get more information out here, you need a bigger detector or you have to move the detector uh, closer. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is the issue. Uh, the error in SACS is typically a counting error. Uh, instrumentation errors are removed in subtraction, right? So, so as long as nothing moves, if you have you know, scattering from slits and stuff, uh, all this subtracts away. The same with, with issues with detector chips. Uh, your beamline staff will mask out parts of the, the detector to exclude from the integration. So this would be like things like the beam stop or those little grids that, that, that Greg was showing you on the dextrose detector. And you know the issue is you know once you do the subtraction and you recover your SACS curve, we usually look at it as a log 10 plot. This is a standard way to look at biosax data. But the, the thing is what it doesn't show you is that you have negative values because you can't take the log of a negative value. So what you really need to do is look at it as a Q times I of Q versus Q to see the negative values. Because if you have a lot of negative values, then that gives you some sense that your signal is weak or you over subtract it. Okay. Um, so when it comes to data reduction, you got this data you get, you know, from, from the beam line, um, you, you have to go through a data reduction step. And, and what this is, is uh, you have to remove uh, noise or issues from, from the low Q. So this is gonna be things like, like the beam stop noise, uh, contributions from interparticle interference. Maybe you did it at really high concentrations, uh, aggregation. Um, and so what we use here is the Guinea region to help guide us on, on how much data to cut out. And likewise in the high Q, um, you know, the quality of your background subtraction is going to affect the high Q. So 
even though you measured all the way out to the highest possible edge of the detector, that doesn't mean you have a signal and you have to cut the data back um, also. So you wanna trim the low and the high to kind of produce a Sachs curve that then you're gonna use for structural modeling or you know, testing or something like that. Um, so this is uh, an example of data that was collected where uh, we have beam stop noise. You can see it causes this uplift in the, in the, in the subtraction subtracted data. And this is because we had a slight movement of the uh, x-ray window as this thing was being subtracted. And, uh, and, and you see this at low concentrations. If we did this at 10 times the protein concentration, we wouldn't see that, but we see it here because we're in this, this uh, low concentration regime, which is causing this beam stop noise to come through. And so what happens is Guigné, he, he kind of worked out this approximation that in this low Q region, you should have a linear relationship, uh, uh, you know, if your particle is of the right size, and you can use this as a guide to cut back uh, the, the high Q data, uh, the low Q data. And this is what it looks like. So if we plot the data using the Guigné approximation, you can see this uplift in the data. And then what we want to do is just cut back on a few points so that we can uh, fulfill this linear relationship, this linear Guinea relationship. And so as we cut it back, you can see we get our linear relationship. And so the maximum that we do here, uh, the rule of thumb over the years is that the Q max times the radi radius of gyration should, e should be less than 1.3. Um, and so, you know, in scatter, when you do this, we, we plot this out for you so you can see roughly what the Q max is. So you just kind of cut back on the Q min. Okay. Um, this is another example here where, you know, as I keep saying, SACS is a measurement of two. Uh, buffer subtraction uh, provides more uh, is more reliable uh, via sex SACS. Um, and that data truncation in low Q is managed uh, via the Guinea fitting. So what we have here is, is um, this is glucose isomerase at very low concentrations. Again, you could see a whole bunch of points here, which, which, are, which would throw off any fitting. So then we, we cut it back, we recover that linear Guinea relationship. And then now what we're really looking at is what does the high Q look like? So this is a low concentration of glucose isomerase. And you can see when we plot it Q times I of Q versus Q, you have, a, you have about half the values here are negative, right? So you really wouldn't want to fit that. You'd want to cut the data back uh, to get rid of most of those that region because it's just noise, right? If you fit the noise, then you'll get an artificially low chi-square, right? And that's kind of like cheating, so we don't want to do that. Um, and this kind of shows you that, you know, if you take something like BSA uh, and you do a titration down to low concentrations, you know, at 6.6 .6 mg per mil, you have a very nice recovery of the signal all the way out to uh, the high resolution limit here. And then as we titrate down lower and lower and lower, you can see that the black, uh, the curve in black is starting to flatten out, right? And so we're starting to lose that signal and it may not be best that we try to fit that, right? And so the question is, where, where do we actually really stop it? And I'll show you that later. Um, and this is kind of a quote from James Holton here. You know, if you're trying to measure a difference to better than 1% with a measurement error of 1%, you need around 20,000 counts uh, out here um, in each the buffer and the sample to achieve that. But the problem is when you measure out here with stacks, you're typically measuring about 10 counts, maybe 100 at most. So you, you, know, you really have to expose the sample for a long time to try and measure that. And the problem with that is you're just gonna introduce radiation damage. So you have to think about if, I, if you really need this data here and you're at low concentrations, then you're gonna have to you know, stabilize the sample for a long exposure. Um, so this is, this is what radiation damage looks like. So if you kind of plot the exposure here, so this is frame number, uh, we're doing, we're going up to 30 seconds um, and we're just kind of plotting for each frame, each second, the I zero against the RG. You can see that the radius gyration is increasing as we go to longer and longer exposures. And likewise, the I zero is increasing, right? So I zero is proportional to the uh, volume squared. So the volume of the particle is increasing. Um, so like I was saying, if you need the long exposure to get high Q information and you can't go to high concentrations, 
then you have to think about uh, radiation mitigation strategies. And so the good things that we like to see in SACs are things like sucrose, um, about 1%. It's very stabilizing to a protein, and it really absorbs a lot of the, the free radicals. Uh, glycerol is good. Uh, potassium or sodium nitrate is really, really good. Keepies is, is good, and same with tris. Uh, but you typically have to go to like 100 millimolar uh, in heapies or tris to see some effect. But this is this is kind of a good example here where we take um, BSA and PBS buffer, right? Uh, we do this exposure, so this is in dose, and you can see like um, after about 10 seconds, the the uh, radius gyration is increasing uh, during the entire exposure time. But then we took PBS, added 1% sucrose with potassium nitrate. And what we see is the race gyration is flat across the entire exposure. And so this is a way that you can uh, deal with radiation damage. Okay. So how, how, how far out in high Q should you go? So one of the guides I like to look at is this uh, uh, Q versus I of Q uh, plot. And what's supposed to happen here is if you integrate that, um, it's supposed to approach a constant value, and a constant value is the correlation length of the particle. So, so what you should see as you go to higher and higher Q values, you should pretty much, uh, you know, reach a plateau and then just keep going. And so, what you see here with with the sample in brown, which is BSA, in uh, in in a perfectly buffer matched sample, um, you get this you get this nice plateau. Whereas in red, this was BSA that was uh, mixed, I think. And then we didn't really do a good job buffer matching it. So we just kind of resuspended it. Um, and you can see that the background subtraction at high Q is, is, is worse. So for the red, we would probably think about cutting the data back to point two. Now, you don't have to do that because the thing is, if you have a model and you're trying to fit it, if you have a model for the background correction, then that's fine. But most of the time, people don't model that. And that's where you kind of get in trouble because as you're trying to fit that, then you're going to have like this false, you know, positive fitting, seeing things that are not there. Okay. So to summarize in the low Q, you have beam stop noise and aggregation. This will bias the Guinea region. So you can mitigate that by truncating the, the low Q data. And this is going to be critical to modeling. So, you know, determining really where your Q min should start is, is, is essential to subsequent steps in ab initio modeling or you know, using foxes or you know uh, uh, the, the 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 ensemble searches and stuff like that. The high Q, the usable data is determined by uh, ultimately how well the counts are measured. But you don't need to worry about that because most of the time, my scientists are taking care of that. But it's your buffer matching, and you want to inspect the integrated intensity plot to kind of see that see that plateau. Um, and the other the other big uh, indicator here is if it's really difficult for you to get a reliable P of R um, distribution from the data, you might want to truncate the high Q and see if that stabilizes it. And that's usually another good indicator that your high Q is, is corrupted. Um, this matters a lot. <clears throat> uh, this doesn't matter. The high Q stuff doesn't matter a lot in ab initio modeling, typically because these programs like Dan, Damon, Gasborn, Denford, they use this Q to the four weighting, so they really down sample or down weight any high Q information. And they, they really look at the, the low Q. Having said that, make sure you truncate the low Q appropriately because you want to get any of that of this, this artifact out of there because the, the ab initio stuff is going to bias towards that. Um, atomistic modeling, again, this is, this is going to give you some false, false positives, right? So again, you want to really think about uh, 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 nailing down your low Q and your high Q. Um, and like I was saying, programs like Foxes and Chrysol, they, they, they don't really account for poor background subtraction. You do have a constant that you can fit with, but you know it's 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 buyer beware here. So, um, okay. So your distance distribution function, like I said earlier, is the real space representation of your SAC data. Okay, and so if you take your SAC data measured in reciprocal space, you do the Fourier transform, you get this P of R distribution. And what's important about that is um, if you have if you think about a distribution like a rod, it's going to look like this. You have a lot of short distances and very few longer distances. The sphere kind of looks like this. You know, it's a big, big uh, 
a big bin in the middle, and then something that's hollow, you can see the large distances are pushed out. So really you're asking this question is when I do my P of R distribution, how many bins do I actually have in the data, right? Is it, you know, is, is it completely trivial? Do, you know, do I make it up? But it turns out that there's a relationship here that the maximum reliably measured Q max times D max, this is the maximum dimension of the particle divided by pi, this determines the, essentially the number of bins that you can divide your P of R distribution up in. And so as you measure a higher resolution, you get more bins, right? And what that means is that as you get more bins, then that, that means you start to see more features in the P of R distribution. And so if you look at something like this in red, which is the uh, atomic P of R distribution for uh, the P4, P6 RNA, there's a lot of little wiggles here, right? And that means if you had a lot of really small bins, you can start fitting a polynomial uh, to this to capture a lot of those wiggles. Um, and what happens is if you have very few, if you have very large bins, so very few, very few terms in your polynomial, you get, you get a P of R distribution that's very smooth, right? And as we go to higher Q max, where we increase the Shannon number, increasing the number of bins, we start to fit more and more of those features in the P of R distribution, right? So this is what resolution in SACS is. It's, you go to higher Q values, you get to fit, you know, smaller bins in your P of R distribution. And this was all worked out by Peter Moore back in like 1980. And what's interesting about that is if you think about SACS right now, if you measure to a Q max of 0.42, a D max of 43, that means that your Shannon number is six. So that means you need essentially six equally spaced points to fully capture the information in the SACS curve. And likewise, if you go to a D max of 240, uh, you need 32 points. But with a modern detector, like the ones they have at Sybils, or here at B21, you're in the neighborhood of 1,100, 1,500 data points. So this thing is way oversampled, right? And what's really neat about the oversampling is that it helps us uh, recover the signal more reliably. If you only had six points, it's hard to get the, the P of R distribution. But because we have 1,000 points, we can directly transform the data and recover the P of R distribution. Um, and so with, what this shows you here is like if you measure an I over sigma of one, versus 3.3, uh, the Shannon-Hartley theorem guarantees because of the oversampling that we can recover the SAC signal error free. The SAC signal in this case is the P of R distribution. And what you see here is the overlay of the P of R distributions for both data sets fulfilling the Shannon-Hartley theorem and showing you that we recovered the same signal, one with the error of, one with the I over sigma of one versus 3.3. So that's really cool. Uh, but this doesn't quite apply to things like Fox's Chrysler and Gnome um, because there's algorithmic dependencies, right? So this is the issue with, with applying the Shannon-Hartley theorem is how you do it matters. Um, so, so how you do it, the indirect Fourier transform. So to go from reciprocal space to real space, the programs that are available are things like Gnome. Uh, there's Gladder who started this whole thing off uh, called GIFT. There's, there's my method in Scatter. And there's another one online called Bayes app, which I highly recommend. It's an automated way you can just upload and it does it. It's really nice to, to cross check uh, what you've done or what Gnome's done. So you, the, when you do this, you, you expect a smooth curve with, with minimal oscillations in it, no negative values for the most part. Um, and this is usually an iterative process where you fit a Dmax, look at the answer, fit another Dmax, Look at the answer and you keep assessing this. Um, but you know, today with AutoNome and Bayes app or even my program, we automate this iterative process. And so we try to uh, a whole bunch for you and then we give you what we think is the best answer. And it's always good to check. Now, what I really like about the P of R distribution is that if you measure the SACS data of your protein alone and then the RNA alone, this is what the P of R distributions look like for the protein and the RNA. When you measure the complex, you know, the P of R distribution contains all the cross terms of how those two subunits could come together. And that's what you see here in red is the complex. And what you have here between, um, if you added up the, 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 the gray with the blue, the difference that's left over are all the cross terms that tell you how these two things relate. And that's why when we do SACs, if you measure, you know, uh, an antibody, and then you measure the antibody bound to something, but you don't have the crystal structure, we have actually all the information there 
to put the complex back together. And Mikhail has a lot of examples of this. So you should, you know, if you if you want to get an idea what how to do this or what he's done, just Google, you know, Google his name and Sachs and see what comes up. Um, I, I'm sorry, I need to interrupt you, Ralph. I mean, yes, but then I'm gonna have a, like 20 emails on my computer. So you may also consider <laughs> contact Rob because he has also lots of experience and he also collaborates with the excellent scientists in the UK and Oxford. I'll try Mikhail first. So, <laughs> so, so the other thing is, like I was saying, is, is you recover this signal, you recover the, the, the P of R distribution. Um, and, and the thing is, is, it's the best way, I would say, to assert some kind of conformational change. And the reason is, is usually if you show somebody, like, here we're measuring the lysine riboswitch in the presence and absence of ligand. And if you show somebody, I measured a change, and here it is, reviewers are going to be like this. That doesn't look like anything, right? But what you have to remember is like when you transform the SACS data into the, into the P of R distribution, that Fourier transform is, is every, every data point in here is a transform of the entire, you know, 1100 data points here, right? And, and so if you think about it, the P of R distribution is the best method to detect and assert conformational changes between conditions because the distribution utilizes all the distances but it's resolution limited, right? So that means if you're trying to detect a small conformational change, you may not see a change in the radius gyration in low Q. It might be a high resolution uh, limit that's required. Uh, small changes may not produce changes in RG. So you need data beyond the guinea. And then ultimately it's the magnitude of the change that determines the required resolution limit of the SACS data. If you're trying to suggest that you have a conformational change. Um, and so what you're looking at here with the SAM rubber switch in the presence and absence of a really tiny ligand, um, this is a massive change in the P of R distribution. And it's a big change in the Guinea region. But for the lysine rubber switch, this is a small change, right? It's a very small conformational change. In fact, you know, when they crystallized it and they did, they did uh, something similar to the X-ray footprinting, they just didn't see any global changes in the presence and absence of, of lysine, except to where the lysine was binding were protected the residues, uh, kind of, you know, asserting the fact that this was a small conformational change. Um, okay, so the Cracky plot. Now, when we want to get to this thing about assessing flexibility, the Cracky plot is is kind of um, <clears throat> the the tried and true method from a long time ago of, of saying that you had something that was flexible. And the reason is is if you have if you have a compact particle, compact folded particle. Uh, Polaroid worked out that the integral of Q squared times I of Q equals a constant. And you can see that here for this compact particle that if you plot the data like this, you capture this area under the curve. And if you integrate this area, this, this will decay to zero and it becomes a constant value. Um, if Dubai worked out different phenomena for unfolded particles, and his, he suggested that this is no longer true, and what you see is like for something that's flexible and folded, it looks like this. You just, it just doesn't really return to baseline quickly. It may not ever return to baseline, depending on how, how unfolded you are. But this is something that's semi-folded, right? This is, this is an RNA with, with, with two helices. And the, the helices are intact, but if the, the RNA itself, the overall global structure of the RNA is unfolded. Um, and so when we measure SACS data, these things that we call the invariance is what we can pull out of the data with, that, with very little assumptions, right? So we can look at this, this plot at Q squared times I of Q, make an assessment on flexibility or if it's compact. We can calculate the poroid volume. This is the volume of the particle, the apparent volume. We can calculate the correlation length and we can calculate the radius gyration. So th this is great. You measure Sachs curve, check that the background subtraction is good, uh, remove any, any low Q noise, and then you could quickly pull, pull this information uh, directly out of the, the SAC curve with no model fitting, right? This is what's scattered is. Now, you can take this a step further now. So uh, uh, Poroid's law was this assumption here where if you, if you take Q to the four times the intensity, this will approach a constant value. And then in this case, the constant value is the surface area of the particle. Now, if you divide that by the big Q from, from this cracky you know, assessment here, this big Q here, if you divide that into 
uh, uh, this S, this, this integrated value here, what you get then is the surface to volume ratio of the particle. And this is a nice little feature. You know, you see this a lot in soft condensed matter research. And they're just trying to see like, you know, if you did have a conformational change, uh, did the surface to volume ratio of the particle change? You know, that's something you could look at. Um, the types of flexibility that I think we can kind of assess in SACs are, or, or the types of states or what we have is discrete rigid state, correlated flexibility where there's like a, an applied spring between them and then uncorrelated flexibility. So these are beads moving on an independent string kind of thing, uh, or these domains are acting independently of each other. And what we see is that the poroid volume for this is gonna be much larger than the expected mass based on the mass. And we'll get a poroid exponent near four. Um, for this correlated flexibility, we'll get a very large uh, uh, poroid volume, but we'll see is that the poroid exponent is much less than four. And then for something that's discrete and rigid, we should get a density value that's near like 1.3 with a poroid exponent of, of near four. So what exactly is this poroid to buy exponent? So um, let's get to it in a minute. So this is an example of maltose binding protein with, with RAD51 AP1 attached. So RAD51 AP1 is an intrinsically disordered protein um, and we attach it to MBP or, or I think Gaz did that. And then this is the SACS data of the IDP alone. You can see if you look at it through the cracky plot, this thing is completely unfolded. But what you have is when you attach it to the MVP, it's biphasic, right? You have, you have this bell-shaped curve. It's not really returning to the baseline, uh, but you can see a, this bell shape here. And it's suggesting that you have a partially disordered system along with a compact particle. But when we look at the poroid, um, when we look at the Q to the four intensity plot, you can see this plateau here suggesting that we have you know, a discrete particle. And if we looked at the volume of this, this is 145,000, but the mass of the thing is 80. But this volume is suggesting a particle at the size of 120, so we're overestimating the mass. Um, the poroid divide law, or the poroid exponent comes from this. So like I was saying earlier, poroid suggested that if you plot the data, uh, an integrate Q to the four times I of Q, they'll reach a constant value. The by suggested for something that's unfolded, it should be Q squared times I of Q is equal to a constant. And what you have with the particle is that it's either going to be on this side or this side. And this defines a power law relationship. And we can determine that power law relationship simply by taking the natural log of the intensities and then fitting a line uh, to a linear part of the data that supports this relationship. And we can get the what we call the poroid by exponent. Um, and it should either be two or four. And so when we look at this with, with the lysine ribose switch and the presence of magnesium and lysine, we get a we get a poroid exponent of 3.4. And when we take away uh, the magnesium to unfold it, the poroid to by exponent uh, decreases to 1.9. Uh, and so this is suggesting that the system becomes quantitatively unfolded when we take away the EDTA. Okay, uh, we don't need to talk about that. Um, this is the important part here, dimensionless cracky plot. So um, back around 2010, um, uh, Javier Perez's group suggested using, using this method for, for plotting the SACS data. And what we wanna do is instead of just plotting Q squared times I of Q, uh, what we'll do is we're gonna normalize to I zero. So we get the I zero from the Guinea region. And we're also gonna multiply times um, the, 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 the Q axis by RG squared, right? So this is what we get. So when you do that, we normalize for the size of the particle and uh, on one dimension and the mass on the other or the volume. And what's really nice about that is that if you have a compact folded particle, you should get a peak at the square root of three with a value of 1.104. And so for xylanase and glucose isomerase, you know, this, this thing is like five, six times bigger. Um, you can see they're both compact particles. You get a peak right at that position. And then um, as, as we apply it to these other systems here, like the SAM ribose switch or the MVP RAD51 AP1, or RAD51 AP1 here, um, you, can, you can kind of put these all on a, on a relative scale, correct it for concentration, correct it for size, and really assert that you have a flexible system or a partially flexible system. Okay, and this is an example where we applied it to uh, some data collected at, at Sybil's a while ago. Uh, 
this this is uh you know this was this was actually not in their paper i pulled it i, I grabbed the data because i thought it was really neat um but in the so they have this protein bound to this uh alone it's 50 kilodons so in the dimensionless cracky plot it's suggesting that it's partially unfolded or flexible uh we add the rna and you can see that the sac state in dimensions cracky plot hits that point and it becomes this compact particle in the presence of the rna so you have this, this, you know, really this kind of uh, driven assembly going on. And this is what the P of R distribution looks like. There's a massive change in the P of R distribution, which would then give you, a, you know, likewise a big change in the rays of gyration. Um, okay, so I only have a few minutes left, but I just wanted to show you this one part here um, about, about the, uh, uh, here it is, yeah. Okay, so this is the tandem column. So what we did here was we did we did the Shodex column of 403, KW403, and we mixed together BSA with glucose isomerase. If you put that down a single column, you would not resolve those two uh, on a single column. They, they run as a single peak. But because we did this tandem column, we had baseline resolution of BSA from glucose isomerase. And the runtime was 78 minutes. The column itself was the, the 403s, which are smaller in volume, 4.8 mils each. Uh, but you, you improve the peak resolution by doing this. And there's another group that did that. Rob, um, uh, uh, Rob sorry, I need to interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, what was the concentration of that? These pressure samples, because PSA and glucose are very so difficult to purify, especially it's from insect cell purification, that's right? BSA is from cows. I know. I don't yeah, know what glucose isomerase is from. What was the concentration <laughs> of your sample that you inject on a double column? Um, there were five mix per mil each. So we made stocks at 10 and we injected them. 50-50 uh, okay. mixture. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Glucose isomerase okay. is used in uh, bodybuilding. Uh, so the protein shakes. Is you it? can buy kilo, kilogram of it. But yep. when we talk about this separation problem, people have a problem to give us 50 microliter of two mix per mil. So that's kind of a uh, yeah. relevance to it using the double columns. Yeah, no, this would not resolve. We, we ran it, you know, we did the control and then we did the tandem and you get this really great resolution of the two. But, you know, the caveat is your runtime is a lot longer, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then this was somebody, they, they applied this to using the Wyatt columns, which are again, similar to the Shodex, um, and they got better resolution. They're looking at nucleosome particles here. Uh, they tried three serial linked superdex columns. They didn't work quite as well. The Shodex columns did a lot better. Um, and the runtime on this was crazy long. So I, I would try the Shodex columns first. Um, and then, Great. thank you. you. You know, columns matter, right? So this is a superdex 200. This is xylanase, it's a 21 kilodalton protein. Um, this is the performance. It's a new column that we ran. And you can see there's a, there's a shoulder here. Uh, same sample, same day. This is using the 403 Shodex column. And you get resolution of that bump, right? So this is, this is a really good column to use. But the caveat is, of course, that um, it's, it's made out of silica. So, you know, your protein, if it likes negatively charged things, you might have some issues of it sticking. So you really have to adjust the salt concentration. Um, and we see like mostly for extracellular matrix proteins, things that bind heparin, uh, they, they tend to interact with the Shodex columns. Um, and this is another example, Shodex, Superdex, same sample, same day. You can see, um, you know, a really good lean to this, um, but there is some resolution of, of the species using the 403. And, you know, here you would actually want to do a tandem column to see if you could separate it further. Um, okay. So what I wanted to kind of go over quickly too, because I'm running out of time, um, is, is um, this thing about, you know, how to compare the signal across the stacks. And what we ended up doing was we, when you calculate, if you take, if you take this like one Sachs curve here and you subtract it to, from the next one, what you essentially have is a residual, right? And you keep going all the way across and you'll have residuals for each one that you measure, right? So, so what happens is if, if the signals are exactly the same, the only difference between them should just be random noise, right? And we could quantitate that random noise using what's called the Durbin-Watson statistic. And what's really nice about the Durbin-Watson statistic is that random is two, 
right? And if you're positively correlated, you're, you go above two. And if you're negatively correlated, you go below two. And so what we do with the, with the scatter and the sex stacks is we calculate this Durbin-Watson statistic and we make these little heat maps um, like this. So, you know, we go from frame 15 and we're gonna calculate the next frame 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, all the way to 80. And we're calculating a Durbin-Watson statistic. And what, you know, what we want out of this is a region that's gonna be, uh, the scale is off here, um, but it should be cyan on, on scatter now, not red. Uh, so you're looking for the largest, you know, region of the same kind of cyan color. And as you start going into this part of the, the frame, like frame 60 here, um, it's telling you that it's different and you don't want to merge that, right? You want to keep, uh, this is all about guiding your, your, your merging. And this is on scatter. If you go to scatter, there's, you know, there's uh, bioisis, there's a little tutorial online. Um, and this is another example. This is horrible background subtraction or they, they, what happened here was the the um, during during the column buffer exchange they didn't wait long enough and so you could see that the buffer is recovering, and and so what you're doing here then is when we look at the the um, uh, Durbin Watson statistic across the peak, uh, there's this nice blue region that you would then just grab and merge that and then form the average curve. So here we would use frames 440 to 492 uh, for the averaging. Um, yeah, and that's what it looks like after it's averaged, right? Okay, uh, I think that's it, right? I'm supposed to be done now? Am I supposed to be done now? Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, everybody in the past, the advanced light source, <laughs> and, um, you know, my crew at the Diamond Light Source now. <laughs>